Good morning, you guys. It is 10 o'clock. It's time for chapel. Really excited. Um, you might be like, who is this weird dude up here? Um, Ryan Lee is in Uganda, if you didn't remember that. And so I'm taking his place today. I'm just going to be announcing the person and praying for us. So as you're finding a seat, I'll pray for us and we'll get into it. So dear Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for Ryan Lee and just all that he invests um, in our campus. And we pray that you'd be with him while he's in Uganda. Just bless him with a really restful time while he's there. We thank you for Sarah Jo, who's willing to come and speak to us today. Um, just give her the words, give her peace um, as she's sharing. Um, yeah, and give us attentive ears in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm excited to welcome up Sarah Jo Waldron. Sarah Jo has a Master's of Arts in Public Administration and a Master of Arts in Theology. She was a youth pastor for seven years and has been a full-time elementary school substitute teacher for the last three years. She was just hired as the chaplain for a retirement community where she lives in Len Lenexa, Kansas. Is that correct? Her and her husband, Lee, have three children and love the Dodgers. Sarah Jo is a Tabor alumni and loves teaching and preaching almost as much as she loves a really good joke. So welcome up Sarah Jo Waldron. Good morning. It's always good uh, to be here with you. I'm in a little transi transition uh, right now. I have about a month more of substitute teaching and then I'll start full time. Uh, as a chaplain at the retirement community, but I'm there on the weekends right now. So I spend my weekdays getting gas lit by first graders on a regular basis. You know, I say, Avery, there's no running in my class. I just saw you run. You need to sit down and try it again. He's like, but I wasn't running. I didn't run. You didn't see me run. I wasn't running. That was Casey. Casey was running. I was not running. Like, yes, you were running. That's not safe. Please sit down. Try again. And, no, I wasn't. You did not see me running. And all of a sudden I'm like, did I see him running? I, I'm like, maybe, what? I, no running, go get in line. You know, I, I, I just feel like they're so good at offering an argument for what it is uh, they did not actually do, even though I saw it with my own eyes. And then on the weekends, I spend my time being critiqued by the senior citizen fashion police. I was informed yesterday by one of my sweet little old ladies as she came in and I greeted her for the service. She said, you know, Sarah Jo, there's a group of women that watch your outfits very closely. I said, okay. And she said, and there is a rumor going around that you don't wear socks. <laughs> now, I cannot believe it. I know, I know, I cannot believe it. Uh, and when I'm full time, I'll start attending that weekly meeting. But maybe during my sermons, I should just start going like this. <laughs> Show off my old lady socks. Like, don't worry. I wear pantyhose too, ladies. So uh, that's how I spend my days right now. I love it. I love going from the spectrum of six-year-olds to 90-some-year-olds. My oldest person that attends every Sunday is 104 years old, and she's smart as a whip and can hear everything you say, and it's incredible. So I am just humbled uh, between these two ends of the spectrum of God's people. Uh, so before I dive in to this morning, will you pray with me one more time? Lord, we commit this time to you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe on my words and that you would touch us in the places, the intimate places of our spirits uh, as we learn from you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I have a shirt that says, love anyway. It's a simple and profound statement, even when, fill in the blank, love anyway. Anyway, and I think as a general rule, if you did a survey asking people whether or not it was good or important to love others, a high percentage would probably say yes. Christians especially would say yes to that. They would say, yes, we love others because Christ taught us to love one another. Uh, but there would also be a lot of people who offer exceptions to the rule. It's okay to not love when fill in the blank. And that makes me wonder what we think or understand love to be what is god calling us to when he commands us to love our neighbor and to go a little further i beg the question what is the interest of love can it be loving to offer constructive criticism to someone sure yeah of course we can think of examples of that i would say yes if the interest is in their benefit and growth but is it love if the interest is in shaming or ridiculing no, it's not. 
if the goal of a hard conversation or a difficult interaction is greater abundance in the world and someone's life, then even things done assertively and boldly can be done as love. And yet, love often gets kind of this bad rap of being sort of fluffy, right? Just this fluffy thing, love. And it's like people are saying like, well, what can love do? Like, what can love do? Sometimes what you really need is just a whole lot of power, money, knowledge, and influence to get things done. None of that sappy love stuff, right? That's definitely a narrative in our world. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't fluffy, sappy, or soft at all. And he said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And even when he was faced directly and insistently with hate, he challenged his followers to love anyway. That didn't mean he would tolerate abuse or oppression. He had every intention to change the world for the better because of love. You see, he was convinced that love wasn't some weak man's excuse. Love wasn't a cop-out to avoid conflict. He was convinced that even when the abundance of his own life and all of the lives of people with dark skin like him were threatened, he maintained love for humanity, for life. And he led a world-changing, non-violent movement that honored God and valued the lives of people. And Dr. King was no pushover. What he was, was a Christian man, a flawed one, of course, but a man devoted to the way of Jesus, who told his disciples to love their enemies and pray for them, while also instructing them to defend the cause of the oppressed and seek justice and love mercy. Love is no weak thing. And I open with that today because we're going to reflect on some words from Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But before we can do that, we need to build up with some reflection over Ephesians, over Ephesians in general that sort of shape uh, what I want us to consider today. Before I say anything else, I want us to consider this. So two of our most important Greek manuscripts, so that's the original language that these were written in that we learned from and collected and then they transcribed into other languages and you have all of that. Uh, but two of the most important Greek manuscripts that we have for the book we call Ephesians do not have in them the phrase in Ephesus. They don't have it. They don't offer something else. They just don't have it. Okay. And the reason I bring that up is because there's no other situation like this in any of Paul's letters. And the best scholarly guess is that this was what we would consider a circular letter, a letter that was meant to circulate around. So it wasn't a letter specific to a group of people to address an issue that he heard they were having and so he needed to offer a response to it. It was more a general letter for all believers in the early church in the first century. Right? He's like, pass this around. In fact, at the end of uh, Colossians, it says, make sure you read my other letter. It might be this one. And the reason that it would have maybe been left blank from these other manuscripts is that it's sort of a fill in the blank for the people there. To the saints in Laodicea, to the saints in Colossae, to the saints in Ephesus. And there's something about that as we consider the practical theology of Ephesians, because today maybe we can consider it saying to the saints in Hillsboro. We still have a pretty big cultural jump, but it is worth noting that about this passage. And Ephesians is really pretty interesting. It comes right after Galatians, and Galatians is this like to the point confrontational book. Uh, it's pretty brief on affirmation, but Ephesians like swings to the other side. There's a major vibe shift. And while where there's this focus on practical theology for all believers, it's motivated by affirmation and praise. And this is the language and framework that Paul is going to use to make his appeal to the believers. And this is actually a strategy that's employed a lot in Greek rhetoric. Um, 
um, to use affirmation and praise to sort of convince people of something or to inspire devotion from someone. And it's something we do all the time. I use it daily at the elementary school. Let me give you an example. I have a little girl in my class who has a very hard time letting adults be in charge. And she doesn't always want to listen to the directions or follow instructions and lives in her own little world. So we're really working on that. But when she's having a good day, when she's making good choices, I, I kneel down in front of her and I say, you are doing so great today. I am so proud of you. You are working hard, listening well, and following directions. You are amazing. I know tomorrow is going to be even better than today. And she's like, that's right. Mm -hmm. She's got some grit. So she's like, okay, I see you. I'll raise you one, right? She's inspired to keep doing better because of the praise and affirmation she receives. And Paul does this in Ephesians. But the praise and affirmation is directed at God. God is so worthy of praise. God is so good. You should be more devoted to following the ways of Jesus, his son. And it, this is so elaborate for Paul in Ephesians. He, like, when he could say three words, he uses 27. Uh, verses 3 through 10 in chapter 1 are one sentence in the Greek. It's like an English professor's nightmare of run-on sentence. He just cannot stop because God's blessings are so good. And that's what he wants them to remember as motivation for being more deeply rooted in the truth and walking in the way of love. So let's consider the aim of Ephesians, like the general aim. And there's lots of different ways you could summarize this. But one way would be in the middle of a prayer that Paul offers in verses 17 through 19 in the first chapter. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe so that you may know the hope to which God has called you, the riches of his inheritance and the immeasurable greatness of his power. Paul's use of the word hope is different than the connotation it carries today in the 21st century. And in fact, the way he uses it should kind of challenge us and push us, not only in our understanding of what hope means, but in our application of living in this hope. So, first of all, the word hope, the way Paul uses it, uh, simultaneously exists in two forms, okay? And the first is that it means coming to know and living in the truth that Jesus Christ set us free and, and because of what Jesus has done, we are alive together in a new community. And we live in that hope in the here and now, and we also anticipate it in the future when Jesus returns. Second, this hope to which they were called means identifying themselves with Jesus and with the new diverse community of Jews and Gentiles together. Christ's death broke down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles. You've probably heard that before. And when Paul talks about hope, he talks about them existing within this universal community of believers and living in this hope requires a practical commitment to a certain way of life. The hope to which they were called involves both a personal identification with Jesus and a commitment to the immediate social consequences of life within a diverse community that is inclusive of both Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles did not have to become Jews or adopt Jewish customs to exist in this community. Jews did not have to stop being Jewish or cease participation in Jewish traditions to maintain their place either. Jesus has done a new thing, not because the kingdom of God has changed, Rather, the mystery of God's wisdom and kingdom has been more fully revealed in the work of Jesus. And it's time for citizens to embrace and embody this new revelation. Paul is less interested in defining boundaries for the church. 
He's more interested in teaching them the vices and the practices that engender division and marginalization. He wants them to throw off those things so that they can be unified, not uniform. Jews were not gonna be like Gentiles. Gentiles were not gonna be like Jews. The goal is not uniformity. And while it's easy for us to look and say, yeah, Jews and Gentiles together, yay, that's old news. How different is that than Catholics, Presbyterians, Baptists, Nazarenes, Methodists, Mennonites, all coming together and valuing and loving one another in unity, in the bond of peace, even though we have theological differences and a different way of viewing things or practicing our faith tradition. Wherever there's diversity, there's conflict, difficulty, and challenge. And Paul says the goal here is unity, not uniformity. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be committed to the new social rules, the new way of doing God's kingdom. Now, another part, an important part of unpacking Ephesians is to recognize that it's a prison letter, okay? We know this for certain because three different times Paul feels the need to emphasize, I write this letter from prison. So the thing is, considering the social stigma around being imprisoned, you would think Paul would kind of avoid this, right? To help, to help his message have credibility, right? Like, not, oh, that's a message from a prisoner, you know? Like, ooh shady right like just avoid that Paul like just don't even say it if word gets around fine but you don't have to say it in print you know and yet Paul totally swings the other way and and won't stop emphasizing it he will not stop emphasizing that he's in prison and he does that because he sees the dynamic as further evidence of the power and mystery of God God demonstrated God's dominion and authority in a very unique way through the humble birth, life, ministry, and criminal death that Jesus suffered. Paul's imprisonment is an echo of this same principle, one that is succinctly described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 through 28, when he says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Paul's life of suffering and imprisonment is a declaration of God's power in weakness and everything that the world disdains. Paul proclaiming this message from prison does not undermine God's gospel. It validates it. It validates it. And we would be quite foolish to forget that. Hope in God's victory over death, hope in God's kingdom come, it's something quite different than what it has been made today. You see, in the early days of the church, Christianity flourished as a marginalized, persecuted, and oppressed people group. And the places where believers practice the greatest devotion to the gospel and where the gospel is spreading at the fastest rate is where persecution against the church of, of Jesus Christ is greatest still today. It wasn't until Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. I have my own reasons for using air quotes about that. But it's when Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in the fourth century that this reality of the early church shifted, okay? Constantine was a conqueror, and in a battle against Maxentius, he accredited his victory to the Christian God. Now remember, there were lots of Greek and Roman gods, and this was a common practice to accredit something to a god who you found favor with. Well, he has some reasons for this, and he accredits, accredits it to Israel's god. So he's like, I am now a follower of Israel's god. And there's various evidence in history that he didn't fully stop worshiping other gods. He just kind of added Israel's God to his repertoire of gods. But he did declare Christianity as the religion of Rome, okay? And that's, that's a big deal. There was a lot of propaganda that went out about Constantine as a Christian emperor. 
And he declared Christianity as Rome's religion and continued conquering uh, other territories and living as a very like dominating emperor under the banner of Christ. And this is fascinating, okay? It's fascinating that Christianity would be named Rome's religion because Christianity had been previously viewed as problematic in Rome. Persecution of Christians in Rome was driven by the empire's need to inspire widespread trust and devotion. The budding of new faiths that were just rapidly spreading uh, in the late third century meant that the growing number of Christians in the Roman world was dangerous for maintaining the traditional religious and social order of Rome. Christians disrupted the uniformity of the empire because they refused to devote themselves to Rome's gods, and that was threatening to the leaders of Rome because they believed that devotion to those gods is what kept them in favor with those gods. But for the first time in history, Christianity becomes the religion of the empire. It becomes the imperial religion. And Constantine is what appears to be the first ever Christian nationalist. Consider that just for a while. The contrast of that to the Apostle Paul, who proclaimed the power of God from a position of complete powerlessness and invited brothers and sisters of the faith to join him in his suffering. Those two things look pretty different. So remember these two things about this circulated letter among the early church in the first century. The primary aim of Ephesians is to urge believers to know the hope to which God has called them. A hope that requires a practical commitment to a certain way of life, one that identifies with Christ and the immediate social consequences of existing together in diversity. Second, this is a prison letter, and the fact is not a hindrance to, but evidence of God's power. Power that was exercised in a way foreign to this world. Foolishness to this world. It is the power and wisdom of God. In the story, the birth, the life, the ministry, and death of Jesus Christ. So keep those things in mind as we read these final verses today. Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 2. And remember that these are the things that Paul was advising them, teaching them to do in order to live in love, to walk in the way of love, to be unified, not uniform, and let that sink in. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. Walk in the way of love. We long for the eternity, the eternal hope which Jesus secured for us, but we also live in the hope of Jesus today, and that should change the way we live in the world. It requires something of us. It requires a change in our daily living so that we interact with and love a diverse chorus of people in the world. How we exist in this diversity is described as walking in the way of love. The power narrative in Christianity in which Christians should rise to the top, dominate all platforms of leadership, take control of every possible organization and institution is the Emperor Constantine narrative. The idea that Christianity should expand in such a way that it rises to worldly power and lives in dominance over peoples and lands is not the way of love. It is not the way of Jesus. It is the way of empire. 
And it always has been and always will be. And the way of love is not the way of weakness and avoidance. The way of love is fierce and filled with suffering. We often think that those with all the power, money, influence, and knowledge, they're the ones who worked the hardest, dedicated the most, sacrificed the most. And I disagree. Often, those who worked the hardest, sacrificed the most, and exercised the greatest dedication are the unnamed saints who laboriously live in the way of love, making silent social sacrifice at the hands of the powerful just so that they can live in the way of love and build the kingdom of God in the upside down way it was intended. Jesus said in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in John 15, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is my command, he says it again, love each other. And in Matthew 5, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. No one human in all of existence has set a better example for us than Jesus on how to walk in the way of love. And that walk did not earn him worldly power or fame. It led him to the cross. People hated his way of living and his walking the way of love so much that they killed him. Walking in the way of love will cost us something sometimes. And it will be hard. But the truth is that it takes far more grit and resolve and humility and commitment than hate will ever take. Hate and slander and using words to tear people down and dehumanize them will always be easier. It will always be the way of the crowd. But to love, that radical, self-sacrificing love that aims for the abundance of life for all people, even the ones you disagree with, even the ones who vote differently than you, even the ones who hold different theological beliefs than you, that's the way of Jesus. Because he didn't tell us, love your theology, love your religion, love your knowledge, love your tradition. <laughs> he said, love one another. And I can't tell you how to unpack that in your life. There's this there's these teachings about preaching that you should have those steps, those application steps that someone, that people can follow, that are tangible, right? And I've just never been able to do that because the truth is I trust the Holy Spirit to speak to each of you. Whether you've trusted in Jesus or not, I believe that God is constantly communicating with us and teaching us and drawing us into him. So I believe that the Holy Spirit can help you figure out whatever the heck it is you're supposed to figure out from the word of God. It's not my job to tell you that. But what I do proclaim today is that Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, lived a life of love and showed us what that looks like. And if we profess to follow this God-man, then we are called to walk in the way of love. And that should mean our lives reflect that. May the God who loves you immensely and immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine empower you to live a life of love in the face of adversity and criticism and conflict because it is the better way. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.